All right, welcome to AP Biology. Uh, for this first lecture, I'm Mr. Heisinger, and we're going to trade these off between a few of the different teachers over at Bloom. Um, and just a little bit of how this is going to work, uh, I'm going to talk about our first topic a little bit, and along the way, you guys are just going to answer questions, get you guys thinking, um, and just provide you some of the background information that you'll need so that in class we'll have more time for discussions um, and working with you guys. So you guys are doing more in class, and we can kind of help you along. Okay? And, uh, yep, so here we go. So our first topic is evolution by natural selection. Down here in the corner, we have a picture of Charles Darwin. We'll be talking about him a lot, along with some other scientists. Uh, for this lecture, I had to put on my Charles Darwin shirt. Woohoo! Okay, so here we go. Clickety click. All right, uh, what we have here is the creation of the animals in 1550. Okay, um, there are lots of different beliefs, cultures, religions that have that basically go back to the creation story. It talks about how the animals and plants and everything living, including ourselves, were created. Um, and a lot of this goes back to religion. Um, a lot of people see this as a direct conflict with evolution, and we'll talk a lot more about that in class. Okay. Um, what this is all mainly based off of is what we call doctrine, uh, which is nothing more than a set of beliefs, um, usually based around faith. Okay. This is usually not allowed to change in most religions. That's not always the case, though. Okay. Um, what we're mainly talking about is um, not faith or doctrine or beliefs, but more so science. Okay, and we base all of our evidence off of observations for the most part. Okay, and the first one we're mentioning here is just the fossil record. Okay, um, what we're looking at here in the upper left-hand corner, we have um, archaeologist. Uh, that's not right. That is. Oh, I'm for blanking the name on that, but this is uh, one of the first skeletons found that's a transitional fossil. Um, here are feathers, basically. Okay, but you see a lot of bones and anatomy of that fossil. That fo I'm sorry, that fossil what that fo follow uh, what a reptile would look like, or say the dinosaurs. Okay, um, we have trilobites in the bottom right corner. We have a fish, which we still have today. Up here, it looks like we have um, some type of plant. Okay, and these are all observations. Uh, within science, we can always change what we believe. Okay, uh, it changes all the type and all the time, depending on what kind of new observations we make. As we get better tools in science, uh, we get better at this all the time. All right, we're going to bring up a few different scientists. This first lecture is a lot about some history of evolution. Okay, the first guy we're bringing up is Lamarck. Uh, Lamarck believed in organisms adapted to their environment by acquiring traits. Okay, keyword there is acquiring. Okay. He believed that they could change during their own lifetime. Okay, So disuse. Organisms lose parts because they do not use them. Um, like the missing eyes and digestive system of the tapeworm. Okay, Worms found underground, uh, they, are, they don't have eyes at all because there's no reason to use them basically. They're underground um, and they don't have much of a digestive system. So he thought by these organisms where they were at, not using them, that they lost those traits. Okay. Uh, perfection with use and need. So the constant use of an organ leads to that organ to increase in size, like the muscles of a blacksmith or the larger ears of a nightfly bat. Okay, um, we do have examples of where this actually does work. Okay, if you can picture some tribes in Africa that stretch out their neck. Okay, and you can keep putting rings on there, and right there, Lamarck is talking about how bodies can change and how we can actually like do that per our own need. Okay. Um, what he's more talking about, say, is a whole bunch of giraffes are out in the field, okay? If all the food is extremely high, the giraffes are going to keep stretching their necks until they get to a certain height. Perfection with use and need. That's what he's saying there. If an organism is not using something, we call that disuse, okay? And then they lose whatever that is. Uh, another good example is cave fish. There's a lot of cave fish that don't, they have their eye sockets, but not their eyes, um, because they're no longer needed them for sunlight and whatnot. And we'll talk about why this is a case for some other reasons, not quite his reasoning. Um, he believes transmitted acquired characteristics to the next generation. Okay, So something that I could acquire during my lifetime would then be passed on to the next generations and the next generations. Charles Darwin had a different view about this. So first we're going to start with a little bit of his history. Uh, born in 1809, died in 1882. He was a British naturalist, born into a pretty rich family. Um, proposed the idea of evolution by what we call natural selection. And this is the big thing from this topic that we want to take away, is natural selection. 
uh, collected clear evidence to support his ideas. This is something that Lamarck really didn't do. Lamarck was more of just his idea, um, and this is where Charles Darwin did a lot more science, how we would see it today, than what Lamarck did. Um, one of the things he did was he took a voyage on what we call the HMS Beagle. Okay, this is a quite a voyage. He went around the world. There's a picture of it. Okay, here's our captain Robert, Robert Fitzroy. Okay, um, and this is during the Imperial Age where England's going around mainly through the New World, uh, North and South America, claiming up territories, fighting the French um, and other nations as well for resources. Everything was pretty much being taken for territories. Um, at the time, he was only 22 years old. That's not that old, okay? Um, and he went on this voyage from 1831 to 1836. They did sail around the world, okay? This was quite the voyage, okay? He made many observations of nature. Uh, the main mission of the Beagle was to chart South American coastline, okay? So this was not really just done for natural observations and for science. This was much more for, Eng uh, for England and charting what was around there, basically, okay? Here we see the voyage of the HMS Beagle, started up here in England. I think you guys can see my uh, cursor, okay? Um, and then he went around the bottom coast of South America, stopped at Ecuador, which we'll talk about, went around through the Pacific Ocean, down to New Zealand, through Australia, uh, around the Indian Ocean, up the coast of Africa, back to South America, and then back to the British Isles, okay? Uh, five miles of, uh, off the coast of Ecuador, stopped at the Galapagos Islands. That's these islands right here, up in the right-hand corner. Boop. Circle. Uh, the Galapagos. Recent volcanic origin, most animal species on the Galapagos live nowhere else in the world. But they resemble a lot of species living in South American mainland. Okay, This is a huge clue and a big breakthrough for Darwin. There's all these things that were found nowhere else on Earth, but they represented a lot of these things found in Central America, okay? And here we see the islands. So we have um, Isla Celebor, Santa Cruz, Isla, there's a whole bunch of these and they're all very different actually, depending on how old they are. We say recent volcanic origin. Um, these aren't very old islands, okay? They're a few hundred thousand years old, but for islands, they're kind of like baby islands. Some of these are new, okay? Um, some of them have hardly any life on them at all, are basically bare rocks. Other of them are covered in tropical forests that receive lots of rain. So they definitely vary from one to the next. Uh, succession of types. Armadillos are native to the Americans where most species are found in South America. So we have three banded armadillos and six banded armadillos. Those are the two species that are currently still living. Um, what he found was called glyptodont fossils. Okay, unique to only South America. All right, this is the size pretty much of a large car. Okay, you can't quite tell from the picture while these ones are the size of a cat or a dog, okay? These guys are now extinct, but basically what he said is these were the only things found there, and what Darwin was looking at was the idea that these things are related, this was a past species, these are a new present species. So why should extinct armadillos like these and living armadillos be found on the same continent and nowhere else? That was his main question here. Um, some other unique species, okay? We have the tortoises. These are the Galapagos tortoises. They are very, very, very large, okay? Um, animals that are found on islands without predators usually can keep getting larger. If you're larger, you can usually have more babies, make more eggs, and be more reproductively successful, okay? If you do have predators, that's not always the case. Um, and these guys are very susceptible to predators. They're not used to being afraid of other organisms. There are not a lot of predators on the Galapagos Island, so being larger is actually an advantageous trait for them. Okay, uh, Down here in the right-hand corner, we have what's uh, called an iguana. This is one of the land iguanas. Um, looks very similar to the iguanas found in Central America, but one main difference. I want you to stop and think about that for a second, what it might be. All right, so don't know what you guys answered, and if you put any answer down, you're okay. Um, but one of the things is iguanas found in Central America are very, very green, okay? They're also found up in the treetops. The island that these guys are on, there aren't any trees, and their bodies have slowly adapted to life on the ground and also blending in along with the natural camouflage to the Galapagos Islands. Um, some other things we have here. Uh, the blue-footed boobies. This is one of my favorite birds, okay? Um, these are... Uh, two blue-footed boobies and they have bright blue feet, lots of unique characteristics, and once again, not a lot of predators. If you put these guys in the mainland of uh, Brazil, 
um, or Ecuador or any of the countries found in Southern America, these bright blue feet definitely stand out and it's a key like thing for predators. We'll talk a little bit more how this has to do with sexual selection. Um, and then up here we have the finches, okay, which there are tons of. Okay. Um, at first Darwin thought these were all the same species, but then he realized that they are all very, actually he thought these were all sorts of different things. He thought they were wobblers, finches, sparrows, and, and crows and things like that because that's what they resembled. But then he realized that all of these guys are actually very commonly connected and that they're all actually um, uh, finches. Okay. So here, this is what we call tree thinking. Okay. So this is part of Darwin's original notes. We still have a lot of these. Down here, number one is like an ancestral species, and up here is everything that kind of branches off, okay? We have the large ground finch, the small ground finch, the vegetarian tree finch, the wobbler. Uh, what's the biggest difference between these four birds? Right here, just looking at these, um, doesn't matter what you said, just put an answer down, you're all right. Um, but if you look at the beak sizes, okay? So like the large ground finch, probably an island where they have much larger seeds, okay? That's what they're going after. Uh, vegetarian tree finch going after something vegetarian like he's going after something for plants um, small grounder finch I mean depending on what their beaks look like some of them are getting into cactuses on those types of islands some are designed for picking up very specific insects okay boop, boop, boop. so we have what we know I have called an ancestral species that probably made its way over the Galapagos Islands and then it kind of branched out that one species split up into multiple different things based on natural selection and we call these the descendant species. Um, differences in beaks. Okay, so we have vegetarian tree finch, large insectivorous tree finch. Insectivorous means you're eating insects. Okay, we have small insectivorous tree finch, so they're eating smaller insects. Woodpeckers, which are pulling things out of trees, usually um, grubs and things that are destroying trees. Uh, warbler finches, cactus finch, sharp beaked finch, small ground finch, medium ground finch, large ground finch. Okay, we have seed eaters, cactus, insect eaters, bud eaters. Uh, tree finches, warblers, ground finches. These are kind of the what these guys all kind of resemble. Okay, so our difference in beaks associated with eating different types of foods. Survival and reproductive of beneficial adaptations to food availability on those islands. Okay, so if you were a, if there's nothing but insects and you had a beak that was designed for getting into a cactus, you pretty much just don't survive on that island, okay? And then you die out and those traits are no longer passed out or passed on. If your beak was slightly smaller and it was designed for eating insects or you just had those natural characteristics, you're much more likely to survive and pass on that genetic material. Um, some more observations. Correlation of species to food sources. Okay, So if we're looking at the variation among tortoises, Darn observed that three uh, the characteristics of many animals and plants varied noticeably among the different Galapagos Islands. Among the tortoises, the shape of the shell corresponds, and I'm reading at the bottom, corresponds to different habitats. The Hood Island tortoise to the right has a very long neck and a shell that is curved and open around the neck and legs, allowing the tortoise to reach very sparse vegetation on Hood Island. So on Hood Island, most of the vegetation is taller, and these guys have to be able to stand up and use their legs. Okay, um, These guys, say on Pinta Island or even Isabella, these are highly tropical. They receive lots of rain, and there's lots of cover on the ground. If you notice on the shell, he can't probably lift his neck up as high, and he's eating most of the f uh, food that's found directly on the floor Okay, and really close to the ground. Uh, tortoises from Pinta Island have a shell that is intermediate between those two forms. So this guy is kind of in a mixed. This guy's probably most tropical. This guy's in a place where most of the food is found higher up. Okay. Turtles. Woohoo! Many islands also show distinct local variation in tortoise morphology. So even within one island, once again, these are all vol uh, volcanoes, and a lot of these are actually sunken in. I'll show you guys a picture of one that I've been to. Um, and then they become um, these giant isolated craters. And within these craters, you have all these different species of tortoises that basically got stuck there, and they isolate themselves from other groups and start to have different morphology. This is a picture of just some of the different types of shells they have. Um, perhaps these are the first steps in the splitting of one species into several new species. Okay, That's what he's pretty much observing right there. Um, how we do this all the time? We have what we call artificial selection. So on the right you have what's a typical um, 
mustard plaster. So this is not just the process of the past, but we've done this for centuries, okay? Um, right here, we're looking at an ancestral species that we've developed into Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, broccoli, kale, uh, kohlrabia. I don't know what that guy is, okay? Um, and these are all done based on traits that we have selected for as far as taste, color, food, nutrition, all those types of things. Um, we do this all the time with tons of different species, okay? Um, selective breeding found in pigeons, okay? We don't do this so much anymore, um, but we have what's, what was the raw genetic variation hidden here. Um, they used to take pigeons all the time and breed them for all sorts of unique char characteristics and qualities. And these are some of the things. A lot of these actually are now extinct, um, and you, you can't find them anymore. We'll talk more about that as well. Um, selective breeding. Uh, hidden variations can be exposed throughout selection, okay? So um, all dogs uh, descended from the wolf, okay? And these were all, a lot of the variations that we now have with dogs were all selected based on human needs and characteristics, okay? Whether it be very large, very small dogs, dogs designed, say, in Egypt to run extremely fast and, and do well in that kind of heat. Um, we have dogs that are extremely long, uh, dogs were built for protection. Uh, we have dogs that are incredibly good at sniffing out um, bodies, say, in, like, Germany, um, such as the St. Bernard, okay? Uh, when you have avalanches, St. Bernards were actually designed to go find people that would get stuck in avalanches and dig them out really quick, okay? So we, there's lots of different characteristics. All these guys, however, all stemmed from the wolf. Even within the wolf, there's tons of hidden variations that just aren't being exposed, okay? And by selective breeding, you can take your largest dogs and keep breeding all your large dogs together and get even larger dogs, okay? There's tons of genetic variation within any given species. Okay. Um, a little historical context as far as other people that shaped Darwin's idea. Um, we have Hutton, who posed his idea of gradualism, that things change very slowly. They found this through... Um, lots of geology and how things sh uh, shaped over over time. Uh, Malthus published his essay on the principles of populations, okay, and how populations are constantly fighting and that most things are dying out and not everything can all live at the same time. Uh, Lamarck publishes theory of evolution, okay, which we don't quite um, agree with, and we'll talk a little bit more why, okay. Lyle publishes principles of geology, and then Darwin traveled around the world on the HMS Beagle. And Darwin began his notebook on the origin of species, and he writes his first essay on the origin of a species in 1844. Um, in 1858, Wall sends his theory to Darwin. This is another scientist. They basically came up with the same idea at the same time. And in 1859, Darwin realized he better publish his idea before Wallace does, and has been credited with it ever since. And we'll talk more about that debate and some interesting stuff in class. Um, Later on, 1865, this is when Gregor Mendel published his inheritance papers. So how traits were actually passed on, think pun and squares, genetics, um, and all that kind of stuff. He, he worked with the peas. So Darwin really had no idea how traits were passed on from generation to generation to generation. This is in a historical content kind of where he fits in. Okay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about natural selection. Uh, natural selection, for any for natural selection to work, you have to have a variation. It has to exist within a population, okay? And no matter what you're looking at, there is always tons of variation. You also have to have an overproduction of offspring. That means more things that are going to survive in a given area. This is almost always true as well. Um, if you think about frogs, frogs make tons and thousands of tadpoles at a time, um, knowing that most of them aren't going to survive. Some of them are cannibalistic. They'll eat each other. Most die out. The strongest ones survive. More offspring than the environment can support. Next one is competition. It's kind of like I just said. Um, because there's too many offspring, there's too much, um, too many organisms within a population, they're going to have to compete for resources, space, food, availability, mates, everything. There's tons of competition. Food, mates, nesting sites, escaping predators, all these things. And then you have what we have called differential survival. Some of these are going to be better than others, okay? The ones with better traits, those are the ones that will live, and they will pass on those traits to the next generation. Successful trait, that we call an adaptation, okay? Um, and a specific adaptation can't be bad or good. It's all based on the environment. If you look at bears in general, 
One variation is just color. If you take a polar bear and stick it up into the Arctic or the tundra or someplace where there's lots of snow, being that white color is very beneficial. They can hide, they can find more predators, and it, it does a very good job for them. Um, you take that same polar bear, and right now with ice caps melting, you put them in a place where there's less snow, it is not a successful variation. Successful traits all depend on the environment. It's a huge part. Once you have a different survival trait, you have differential reproduction. If you're surviving more, you're probably reproducing more. If you have a trait that does, you, that does very well, but you can't reproduce at all, you're, you're not passing on any of those genes, it still doesn't quite work. You do need all five of these. Um, adaptations become more common in populations if they're beneficial, and, and there we go. So those are our five big points of natural selection. Um, a little difference between Lamarck and Darwin. Okay, Lamarck, in reaching higher vegetation, giraffes stretch their neck and transmit the acquired longer neck to offspring. We don't believe this. Instead, we look at uh, Darwin's idea that giraffes born with longer necks will survive and those with, uh, and will leave more offspring who inherit those longer necks. The giraffes with smaller necks die out and they just don't pass on those traits. So essences of Darwin's idea. First one is variation, exists in a natural population. Uh, number two, we have many more offspring are born each season than can possibly survive to maturity. Uh, as a result, there's a struggle for existence, what we call competition. Uh, characters are beneficial and the struggle for existence will tend to become more common in the populations, changing the average characteristic of that population. We call these adaptations. Over a long period of time, and given a steady input of new variations into a population, these processes lead to the emergence of new species. Okay, these are the five big points or essences of Darwin's idea. One being variation. Two is lots of offspring. Three is a struggle or competition for existence. Four is adaptations, characteristics that we find beneficial. And the last one is pretty much producing more offspring over long, 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 long periods of time, the emergence of new species. And that's our lecture today, okay? Um, I did want to show you a few pictures. Um, so like right here, this is one of the pictures I've taken to the Galapagos Islands. I think this is still recording. Um, and other here, let's just double check. Right here we have a picture of one of the marine iguanas. This is different than the last one I showed you. Um, everything on the top of his head, this is salt. Okay, There's no fresh water on these islands. These guys have evolved to drink the salt water and they sneeze all the salt backwards onto their head making these crystals. Um, then this is also used for sexual selection. The ones that are bigger and larger with these crystals usually have more mates. If you notice the color of the uh, iguanas, they're actually the same color as the rock below them. Um, yeah. So let me show you guys one more. And then if you look here, um, if you looked at any iguana found in Central uh, or South America, it would have a very large round tail, okay? And they'd be found high up in the treetops, and that would be used for balancing purposes. Uh, this tail is quite the opposite. It's very thin, uh, very flat and long. And what this is used to do is these iguanas swim. There's not a lot of food found on land. They mainly eat algae found underneath the, um, at the bottom of the, these islands in, in, in the ocean, um, and this is a giant propeller, basically. They use it as a paddle back and forth, okay? Uh, if you have a rounder tail, you just can't get as much food, you can't get all the way down to the bottom, you don't do as well. The ones with these larger flat tails are just much more successfully beneficial, okay? All right, we're sitting at about 24 minutes. That's our first lecture. Um, hope you guys are all set and enjoying your summer. So talk to you soon. If you guys have any questions, once again, email any of us.